Good afternoon. My name is Dan Mogulov from the Campus Office of Communications and Public Affairs. Welcome to, what is it, March? Yeah, March. The March edition of Campus Conversations. Um, joining us today is Vice Chancellor Steve Sutton, Dr. Steve Sutton, I should say. He's worked in higher education for over 30 years, currently serves as the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs here at UC Berkeley. His experience as a first-generation college student from a small town in southern Idaho, Ohio, informs his work as an educator, as does his three years of experience as a resident assistant. I assume that was while you were an undergrad or a graduate Absolutely, student? Absolutely, undergrad. Undergrad. Yes. In his role as the uh, vice chancellor, he serves a, and acts as an advocate for a range of issues impacting the college student experience. Steve has a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology. Does that help you in your? Not so much. Yeah, uh, in Microbiology and a Master of Arts in Higher Education and Student Affairs, both from Ohio State University. His doctorate of education is from the University of Houston, where he explored the factors that impact student persistence for those enrolled in web-enhanced courses. His areas of expertise, and I can attest to just about all of these, include organizational development, crisis intervention, change management, free speech, student development theory, and student advocacy. Steve has worked in a variety of functional areas within student affairs during his career, including the Dean of Students Office, Student Union Management, Housing and Residence Life, and Student Activities. Um, I know Steve wrote just a few words to kind of set the table for us. I have a few questions, and again, as questions come to you, if you have questions now, hold up cards in the air and people will gather them. But without further ado, Steve. Great, uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today, coming out on this first day of spring. Uh, and if you're a baseball fan like me, baseball started last night, so I think I'm excited about it. that. Actually, the A's lost to uh, the Mariners. I think tomorrow's the first day of spring. All right, good. 2.38 2 p.m. today, I think. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> any baseball fans? Any other baseball fans? Ooh. Gotta be, yeah? Okay, I know Ann's a Dodgers fan. So, um, well, again, thank you for coming. Um, I know most of you probably are familiar with what Student Affairs does and how we do it, so I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about what is Student Affairs, but I really want to talk for a few minutes about why we have Student Affairs. And I think this is probably the more provocative question from my perspective. Um, and in essence, you know, we know a lot about the college student experience. In fact, we have a whole room of experts right here about the college student experience. I'm sure uh, each of you could talk at length about how you've interacted with students, the things you do to support students, the issues that you see uh, the students are struggling with. And there's a multitude of, of research that's been done to talk about uh, that sort of explains, expands on the college student experience. We know the students are trying to uh, learn to live in community with others. We know that they're trying to uh, become more self-aware, more self-sufficient. Um, we have a college freshman in our home, and I know he's learning to be more self-sufficient, some days better than others. Uh, but essentially, there's a whole host of issues, and we could go on and on in terms of students learning what they want to do for their career, uh, how they want to engage, how they want to develop relationships with other students, how they want to build resilience. That's a big topic that gets discussed amongst, amongst us as educators in terms of providing that challenge and support for students so that they can be challenged a little bit to stretch them, but then also make sure that we can support them so that if they do fail, there's a safety net there to catch them so they continue to thrive um, as college students. We also know that uh, the college student experience is, is very unique depending on the student, where they come from, what they study, uh, what they want to major in, um, who they live with, um, perhaps what their background may be, um, if they're the, the, the first in their family to go to college like, like I was, or maybe a string of the sixth person in their family to go to college. So we have to be very versatile in terms of the way that we do our work because we know the students uh, approach their college experience in many different ways. I do want to talk for a couple minutes in addition just about the things that we're really focusing on in student affairs right now, and there, there are four of them. Uh, the first one is just really uh, navigation. Uh, one of the things that became uh, really clear to me as I joined the chancellor with her fireside chats, she had a series of fireside chats after she started as chancellor, was that students really struggle with how to navigate the institution. You know, we're a big, complicated place. I know from our perspective, we're like, well, just go on the website. It's right there. You know, or just look at the flyer that we sent you. Uh, but it's much more nuanced than that. I mean, even last night with my student advisory board, I have a student advisory board of about uh, 20 students. 
We met last night. We talked a lot about student housing. They were saying, how do we figure out where to live next year? I mean, if we're living in the residence halls this year, we're not quite sure where to go. You know, and I thought that was kind of an obvious thing that they should know, but they didn't know that. You know, and so a big part of what we're trying to do is really help students navigate the institution better. And I think there's many ways that we can achieve that. And part of that comes from just having the mindset within the Division of Student Affairs that we are really there as advocates for students. We're really there to help them. And if, uh, and if we can't get the answer for them, we can connect them with somebody who can get the answer for them, or at least guide them. So that's one issue. The other is community. Uh, this is something that, you know, when the chancellor came out with her five priorities, right after she became chancellor, one of those was building community. I think student affairs is uniquely positioned to address issues of community with, with our students. And there's many, many ways that we can do that. Uh, we develop community in the residence halls. We develop community by creating leadership opportunities for students through the LEAD Center. Uh, we create uh, community for students even just by the informal spaces that we have for them on campus. And so that's so critical for us to be mindful of how we can assist students in building that community. Because one of the things that really helps them excel and work through that Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is developing community with each other. So that's the second one. Uh, the third one is the issue of wellness. One of the things that is of increasing, increasing concern for me, and I think people that do the work that I do, and maybe the work that you do across the nation, is just the level of student mental health issues that we're facing. Um, we know more and more students are facing uh, stress and anxiety and even more sig significant student mental health sh issues. So one of the things that we're really stri striving to do in student affairs is really uh, make sure that we can provide as much support as we can around those issues. And that's not just related to student mental health. That's also related to just being well in general in terms of getting enough sleep, making sure that you're having positive relationships. Uh, their financial literacy is also critical in terms of their wellness. So there's many ways that we're trying to focus on student wellness. Then the fourth focus is really on our organization as student affairs. We have about uh, 1,500 uh, staff within the Division of Student Affairs. We have about 2,500 student employees within Student Affairs, so we have a large, large organization. In order for us to do our best work, we have to focus on uh, the development and the support of our staff. Um, and so we really try to be creative in terms of how um, we do that. One of my favorite things that we do in the Division of Student Affairs is we have something we call Coffee with Colleagues. So the first Friday of every month, uh, during the academic year, uh, staff are invited to come to Crossroads, interact with each other, just be in community with folks within the division. It's a great way for me to get to meet new staff and be able to interact uh, with staff members that maybe I don't know as well. Um, that's something that's become very, very popular. Uh, that was started by my predecessor, Harry Legrand, and we've continued that because I think that that's a wonderful way for us to be able to make sure that we're focusing on uh, the staff within our division. And also part of it that's really important is just saying thank you. This is something I think that uh, we sometimes forget as leaders, um, to say thank you to staff for the, the things that they do, the hard work that they commit, the fact that they're here on a weekend or late at night, putting in extra time uh, to meet the needs of our students. And so uh, being able to say thank you is something I think that goes a long way. Um, you know, we are in the midst of Staff Appreciation Week right now. I think the, the message that Joe Magnus sent out yesterday at the bottom of that message, there's a link that, that, that to, to 92 different things you can do to recognize staff members. So I encourage you to take a look at that because there may be some things on there that you may want to do within your own organization. Is that it? That's it. I'll <laughs> stop right there. Yeah. So let, let's go right to the headlines. Um, admissions is part of your purview. Um, Media reports, I think everybody's aware, implicate or include a, a student who was admitted to Berkeley, perhaps under false pretenses. Where do things stand? What are we doing? To what extent has this implicated or cast some generated some questions about our admissions process? Yeah, well, this is a very, very important issue, as, as I think we all would agree. I mean, I've been listening to the news reports, as I'm sure you have, watching things, reading things. Um, this is uh, critically important. You know, within a week, Actually, today's Wednesday, a week and a day, we'll actually be sending out our admissions officer, uh, offers for our new freshman class. So that's a banner day for us, a very exciting thing that we will do next week. Um, the fact that um, this issue has arisen I and mean, is so widespread, I think, has really angered many people. It's created lots of questions. I know many institutions are seeing themselves as victims in this, um, and I think all those are natural reactions, uh, of course. Um, Within the UC system, you know, the integrity around our admissions process is, is critical. 
Um, we, um, when students apply to Berkeley or to the UC system, they have to sign that the information that they're providing is accurate. Uh, this is true for the SAT as well, you know, or ACT, those, those exams. Same as within financial aid processes. So integrity is really critical to the work that we do. Uh, when we have, and we have processes, I should back up and say we have you know, our code of student conduct um, has, um, and within that code, you know, it gives us the ability to revoke an admissions off offer or to remove or dismiss a student that's a current student or be able to uh, rescind a degree if we need to, if we have found out that that person has been less than honest with us. Uh, we have processes for doing that. Um, we always are going to maintain uh, the integrity of those processes. We're always going to make sure that a student has due diligence or that we perform due diligence, that they have um, access to the process fairly, and we're going to treat them fairly, that they have a chance to be able to respond to what those charges are. These things typically take uh, a fair amount of time because we're very thorough and very careful with those processes. So while I can't really comment specifically on this case because we have... Uh, you know, we want to respect the, the, the privacy of those individuals. Um, I can just uh, guarantee you that this is something that we are certainly exploring and making sure that we're doing the right thing that we need to do. Um, I also mentioned uh, that the UC system is also very concerned about these issues, in particular how we admit athletes, and so that's something that the UC system will initiate in terms of a look at how all the campuses are doing that. Uh, so I'm confident that we will uh, make sure that, with that that integrity is maintained and we'll, and we'll get to the bottom of whatever we need to get to the bottom of. So let me just ask you to step back for a second. As a parent and as an educator and as somebody who's been involved for, a higher, education, for higher education for a long time, what do you think is going on here? And is there some relation? You talked about student stress. Is this all part of a whole, meaning this just crazy drive and it's got to be an admission to a certain college and if not, the, you know, it's a wasted life. I mean, what is the, how do you, when you step back and look at what's happened, what does it say to you? Well, I think there's a few things that are happening and I'm sure this whole crowd could give us some additional ideas. I think part of it's privilege. I think there's folks that feel like, um, you know, they make lots of money, they have lots of influence, their kids should be able to go to school wherever they want them to go to. Um, and I think that's part of it. I think that um, in today's world, you know, trying to get ahead at any means is also uh, what's happening here um, because it is very competitive. I mean, we have, we received 80, 87,000 applications for freshman admissions this year at Berkeley. Uh, that's not the most in the UC system. I think we actually were fourth, and fi fourth or fifth uh, behind um, Irvine, UCLA, San Diego, and maybe another. Um, and we'll end up admitting about 15% of those students. So um, the odds are not in somebody's favor. So people are looking for whatever means they can to try uh, to get ahead. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. I think that this is where higher education has, has migrated in a direction that I'm very concerned about um, because I know that for those uh, students uh, and their families where they maybe did not get into Berkeley to then read this news could be quite frustrating because they know that somebody else who has resources that can pay to have somebody take the SAT uh, for their, their students um, or make a donation to uh, a campus to build a building gives them an op opportunity to get admitted when somebody else can't. Got it. Let's shift gears a little bit. You talked about one of the priorities in your office is helping students navigate. You know, I remember about 10 years ago, we did a whole market research survey, and we talked to employers around the Bay Area, and they said one of the things they really liked about Berkeley students, they didn't feel entitled, meaning they mm -hmm. came into a workplace <clears throat> knowing that nobody was going to hand anything onto the silver platter, and, you know, this feeling that they had succeeded despite the administration, um, not because of it. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I get the part about sense of belonging, but this sort of raises that whole coddling issue that some have accused, observers of higher education have accused that universities are going too far in that direction in terms of hand-holding. How do you achieve that balance and how do you build resilience while at the same time making sure students feel supported? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a, a, a good place to start is to talk to students. 
um, uh, about their experience. You know, one of the things I really enjoy most about my job is I get a chance to interact a lot with students. Not as much as I, as I used to at other levels when I was in other levels of the organization, uh, but I try to have that touch point with students to just find out, okay, what is your experience like? How are you, how, what are the things that, um, where you need more support? And where do you feel appropriately challenged? Um, and then we have to then build upon that, right? And this is one of the great things about having such expertise within the Division of Student Affairs and across campus. We can then hopefully build that correct balance, uh, balance between challenge and support because we want our students to be resilient, right? We don't want them to feel like we're going to hand them everything. Um, and I don't think our students feel that way. But also, too, we don't want to just throw them into the deep end of the pool and expect them to swim. You know, one of the things that uh, we've been very careful about as we've redesigned our orientation activities, now we have Golden Bear Orientation, is to make sure that they have the tools that they need when they first step on campus to make positive choices. So we address issues like sexual violence, sexual harassment. We address issues of choice like uh, whether to drink or not to drink. We don't tell them whether they should or shouldn't because that's a value judgment that we're not, we don't feel we need to make, but we want them to prepare them with the capacity to make the best choices that they can. Um, and I know that this is one of the things that, that we struggle with as administrators in terms of when students come to us and there's certain things that they want us to provide for them, you know, what is the appropriate ba uh, balance between challenge and support? Because we want them to feel challenged, uh, but also, too, you know, we don't want students to feel like, okay, you know, if you don't have the money for your rent, you just got to figure that out on your own. Hmm. Now, to me, that, that's, not the, that's not the right response. If you're food insecure, Good luck with that. That's not the appropriate response. You know, so I think we need to have those type of support mechanisms so that they can really focus on the things that are going to help them uh, set them up to, uh, to move on to graduate school or to um, start their career off on the right foot, et cetera. Okay. Um, I'm going to just turn to some questions we've gotten from the audience and just remind everybody, if you haven't been here before, find to submit questions in the course of the conversation. Just fill out the index card, hold it up. <coughs> Young man in the back there will come gather them up. Um, so the, the question here came from the audience. It, it's a little broad, but I think it's also really important and take it on the broadest level, but maybe we can get specific. And that's, can you speak to the issue of free speech at UC Berkeley? As you know, we know we had an incident just a few weeks ago. Um, today, the White House is apparently going to be announcing its executive order regarding free speech on college campuses. It's an issue right at, back on top of the national agenda. How do you think things are going now? Where do you think things stand? Talk a little bit, bit about where we are and how you assess all that right now. Yeah, and that's, that's a great question. And of course, free speech is very much a part of our legacy here at UC Berkeley. And I think all of us would agree that the free speech movements you know, in the early 60s is something that really resonates with those of us here at Berkeley. And we want to maintain that legacy as a place that protects free speech. I mean, it's interesting because I used to, I used to you know, before moving back to California, I, I worked at a school in Texas. Um, and you know, free speech, if you move across the country, really has a lot of, I mean, there's big extremes there in terms of what you might consider free speech in Texas versus what you might consider free speech in, uh, in Berkeley. And of course, it's very different on a college campus than it is if you walk to downtown wherever, right? So this is a big issue. I think that one of the things I've really appreciated about our chancellor's leadership and the leadership of others is that we're really trying to be a learning organization when it comes to free speech matters. Uh, you know, we really struggled with the things that happened in, in 2017, but I thought that we handled those uh, from the way we handled things in the fall of 2017 versus the spring of 2017. We learned a lot in that time. And the process that we used to rewrite the major events policy, for example, that was very inclusive in terms of community any comments, interacting with students. The fact that we had you know, the chancellor charge the Free Speech Commission to, to build on the work of what we had experienced in, in that year of 2017 was really positive. So, um, you know, Dan and I had the chance to actually go to a professional conference about a week or so ago and present on the topic of free speech. This is a great panel because we had our dean of students and we had David Robinson from our campus council. Margo Bennett was on that. Uh, Ruben Lazardo, Ruben Lazardo was on there from uh, Community Affairs and uh, Ann Jones was on there. So it was great because we had a chance to talk to my peers, people who do the work that I do at all kinds of institutions across the country, um, through the lens of each one of us in terms of the things that we experienced and the things that we saw around free speech matters. So I also want to 
to, to just add to this, that we've got, uh, I mean, one of the things that really occurred to me when we, when we experienced what we experienced in 2017 is that there are a lot of people on campus that are working very, very hard to try to make sure that we can maintain this value of free speech. You know, and I'm thinking most readily of the folks in the LEAD Center you know, who commit a tremendous amount of time and effort to make sure that they are working with students so that students can have events that are successful, that they are trying to be planful, work ahead. Uh, and then we have folks who stepped forward and they, were, um, they volunteered as observers uh, for the Shapiro event, for example. We have uh, many you know, staff and faculty that were impacted in their own work units around issues of free speech and how students were reacting to that and they managed those situations. So this really was a community effort. Uh, this isn't something that just student affairs manage or UCPD manage. It really is a community effort, and I think it's made us better as an organization. So going back to this idea of you know, maintaining that balance between helping students build resilience but also providing them with the support they needed, what do you say to the student who says, you're letting this guy come on campus? Not only are you are letting them come on campus, you're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to provide security for his event, and he's going to say things that would get me tossed out of my residence hall if I were to say them to a to a fellow student. How do you, what's the response to that? Um, because certainly throughout 2017 and even recently, a lot of letters and there was mm -hmm. stuff in the Daily Cal, there were even endorsements of violence to de-platform, in, in that case, Milo Yiannopoulos. What's your response to that when students express that concern about the extent to which the university has felt the need as a result of the law and its values to accommodate some of these speakers? Yeah. Well, going back to your earlier question about challenge and support, you know, if we were going to really err on the side of support, we would say, you're right. We're going to cancel that event. We don't want you to be offended. We don't want your fellow students to be offended. So, you know, that's what we're going to do. And that wouldn't be the right choice. Institutions have been challenged by, about that on those grounds uh, by injecting their viewpoint into uh, what a speaker has to say. I would say that one of the beauties of our Constitution and being on a college campus is that it is a forum for ideas. It's a forum for different opinions. And we want you to be able to be exposed to those different points of view. Uh, now, you know, and I talked to many students who said that they personally felt triggered by some of the things that Milo Yiannopoulos would say, for example. I mean, there's that well-documented example of when he went to the University of Wisconsin and he put the picture of a transgender student up on uh, the screen and people were flabbergasted over that, right? They were offended, and, and they should be. Uh, but I think that um, we can certainly say to students, you know, encourage them if they don't feel like they can be in that space to maybe find some alternative events that they could go to mm -hmm. uh, or some other place that they could be. And I know many of our students did do that because they didn't want to be um, exposed to that. They wanted to be in solidarity around the fact that they don't really uh, believe in that point of view. And I think that that's okay too. We should support that. Okay. Um, going to another question from the audience here as follows. Students, right at this moment, are protesting what they call police brutality on campus. What do you say to those students who feel threatened and unwelcome on campus, particularly as it relates to police presence um, and, sorry, interaction with students of color? Just a little bit of context. I think it was last week there was an incident where two individuals <clears throat> um, were on campus. Apparently one of them had a stun gun. They were apprehended and arrested by UCPD. There have in the wake, uh, charges were subsequently dropped by the district attorney, but there have in the wake of that incident been allegations of profiling um, and expressions of deep concern about what this says, and I think, or about what happened and what it says about UCPD's values and culture. Um, and that's just sort of the background of that question. So if you could just talk a little bit about that, about that issue, about your own involvement, the off involvement of your office in these sort of issues. Sure. So, so part of my approach to the work that I do is I like to address issues head on. So one of the things that I did uh, last night around this specific issue is I brought our campus statement to my advisory board, which actually happened to meet last night, put it in front of them and said, what do you think about this? Let's talk about this. Um, what are your thoughts? And once they learned some of the facts uh, behind what occurred, they understood it. Um, and they also said that they want the institution to have empathy for them. Uh, empathy in terms of the experiences that they have uh, within our campus or beyond our campus. I mean, there's so much in the news uh, we all know. And with social media these days, something happens 
you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you know about it by the time you wake up, but, uh, even if it's a halfway across the world because of social media. And so I think it's really important for us to have empathy for our students, to show that we do care for them, to listen to them, to get a sense of what their perspective is around these issues. Uh, many times, and Dan and I were just talking about this before the session started, part of it is um, um, uh, it involves how we communicate with our students, when we communicate with them. I think that our students are very um, sensitive to when we make campus statements. Are we being reactive to something that's happened? Are we trying to be proactive? And so I think the, the lesson for me is that we need to continue to listen to our students. We know that there are students that feel disenfranchised. Um, our DACA students, I mean, that's a great example of, you know, when uh, leaders uh, in Washington make comments about uh, what's going to potentially happen to DACA students. You know, they want to know that we've got their back. And I think that that's really important for us to be able to say that we do. And so what's your sense? You've been here for a while about UCPD's role and how it's evolved. And here, too, we're talking about a balance issue, aren't we? we at the same time, we want students to be, feel safe and secure. We want to enforce the law. But we also have to understand that different communities have different lived experiences before they got here that affect how they interact and how they perceive law enforcement. What's your own assessment of UCPD and the extent to which it's sort of engaging with these issues? That is a tough question. I know. Let's move to the next question. <laughs> Um, I, I teased uh, Mark Fisher yesterday uh, when he said to me, good luck tomorrow. I said, yeah, I'm going to make it very clear that UCPD and parking do not report to me uh, when we had this conversation. Uh, all selling this aside, though, I think it's really important as a campus leader to make sure I'm supporting other units within the campus so they can do their best work because I'd want them to support me too. And I'd want, you know, I'm a set of eyes and ears, so if there's things that I hear, uh, from my advisor board, for example, I'm going to share those with UCPD. I'm going to share those with Mark Fisher. Um, I think in my, my personal assessment, again, you know, having had a chance to work at, at multiple campuses, I've worked with many different police departments. I think we have an outstanding police department. I think we have a police department that listens to what students have to say. I think that they're also a learning organization. I think they try, uh, they want to do their best work. They need to have the tools to do that. But I think all of us, with any incident that occurs on campus, still have an opportunity to learn and get better. And so to me, that's the really critical thing, is that we need to take a step back, look at how uh, something uh, occurred, and ask ourselves, why do people have the reaction that they had? What mm. can we do to, to do better? How can we correct this? Who do we need to bring to the table to have this conversation so we can become a better organization, a better campus? Um, um, good. Next question, I'm going to take you back to something you mentioned in the beginning about mental health and well-being and care. And it goes as follows. With the increase in mental health concerns, what do you see as the role and limitations of student affairs in supporting and responding to significant student mental health issues? Yeah. So we have a variety of, of, of mechanisms in place that if a student has a, a significant uh, mental health uh, uh, occurrence or um, other things that happen to them, we've got a safety net there. Uh, we've got our center for... Uh, uh, support and intervention. Support and intervention. I, we just changed the name and I get that, that mixed up. Support and intervention. Where they're there to, to really make sure that the, the moment a student has an issue, that they have, uh, th they, can act, they can jump to work and do what's needed to make sure they're supporting students. I also think that we just, probably as an institution, just can't have enough counselors for the, uh, the variety of issues that students are, are struggling with. So I think we need to try to think about ways that we can be uh, as proactive as possible uh, to work with students, make sure that they know that the resources are there, but that we're also then supporting them when uh, critical things come up. We also try to do a really good job of watching emerging issues so that we're not just strictly responding um, in a reactive way to things that occur, but trying to be more proactive. Uh, and then again, this is where that challenge and support uh, question comes up, is that if a student is having struggles, I think we need to be direct with them and say that you know, this may not be the pl best place for them right now. You know, and work with them in terms of a plan for how they can uh, manage the things that they need to manage and yet still be successful at Cal. What do you think is driving the increase? You said at the very beginning of your opening comments that we're seeing this increase. of Is, is it just our students feel more free to report because they know they'll get better support? Or is there something happening on a broader societal level? What, what kind of, what, what's driving the trend here, do you think? 
Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really challenging question, and I'm not sure I could answer that adequately, because not being a mental health professional myself, I'm not sure I could adequately diagnose why we have this increase. Um, but I will say that sometimes, you know, when students know that we are ready and willing to support them, I think sometimes, you know, for better or worse, they want to they want to bring us bring to us uh, their issues, and they want they're looking for support. So. Um, I think college campuses have become much better at providing that level of support and having those mechanisms for um, uh, ascertaining issues as they're emerging, making sure there's a safety net when students have um, issues that occur. And so I think just as we have evolved um, as a profession in student affairs, I think we're doing a better job of trying to provide that support for students. And so consequently, I think, I mean, students today, and this is a generational uh, difference, and we could spend a whole session just talking about generational differences. I think students are much more uh, forthright with mm -hmm. the challenges that they're having. It used to be it was really a stigma to say to somebody that you had a therapist, you mm -hmm. know, or that you were on a drug to control uh, maybe a mental uh, a health issue that you have. Um, I think our students are much more willing to share that they're having challenges today. So, um, you know, it's funny because as I'm sitting up here, I see people in the crowd that can answer these questions much better than I can, <laughs> but I'm not going to put them on the spot and ask and them. And none to of them so. are rushing so, up here to help of you. Of course so. not, right. <laughs> uh, you know, two things that have to be stressors for a significant number of our students are, are things that you've already mentioned, and that's basic needs and housing. And housing, of course, is a basic need, but I know we think about them differently. Update us a little bit about where things stand and how you assess the university's capabilities and programs to provide for, uh, to help students that are struggling around basic needs and also on the housing front. Sure. Well, if you've not had a chance to go to the Basic Needs Center, I encourage you to, to go to that new location at its grand opening a few weeks ago. Where is it? Um, it's over in MLK on the lower level. Um, there's a sign, if you walk like you're going back to Sproul before you get up the steps, you can take a right and go down downstairs there. It's a great, a great um, space that I think is gonna provide a tremendous amount of support for our students. You know, sometimes people ask, well, is basic needs really an issue? Um, and I would say, yes, it is a, a significant issue. I mean, if you look at the research, I think Ruben uh, Canedo, who's our campus expert on, on basic needs, wrote something in the Daily Cal about a week or so ago saying that about half of our uh, undergraduate students and about a quarter of our graduate students struggle with issues around, uh, I think it was uh, food insecurity. Wow. Um, and about 10% of our students, based on the research they've done, struggle with homelessness. Um, you know, the governor has set aside $15 million to help uh, college campuses with issues. In fact, I think it may actually just be the UCs to help us with uh, basic needs issues. Um, we have uh, lots of data, I think, that shows that this is a significant, a significant issue. But to me, that's the, that is the symptom. Right, uh, uh, I think a big challenge that we're having uh, w in terms of assisting students is just being able to have affordable housing, mm -hmm. being able to make sure that our financial aid packages provide students with the things that they need. Um, and so this is something I think is gonna take a little bit longer for us to crack that, that nut, that issue. Um, I think that um, you know, we try to stretch our dollars as, as much as we can. You know, we're going to begin a capital campaign soon. We're going to really focus on uh, scholarship dollars so we can help assist students with all the, uh, these issues. Uh, but it's something that is a significant concern, I think, for all of us that are leaders here at Cal. So I'm trying my best to think of softball questions for you, but I'm right. failing because you're involved in some really complicated issues. So I want to go back to this issue of affordability. What does that mean, affordable housing? I know there have been a lot of, there have been op-eds in the Daily Cal. I know you've got a commission or a committee where students are, where that's being discussed. What do we mean when we talk about affordable housing? Yeah. Well, there's some classic definitions of affordable housing, which would be that only a third of your income, 30% of your income, should be spent on housing. Uh, the people that I talk to, that's just not practical for the Bay Area. Um, there's also some uh, formulas where it's a combination of your housing and your transportation costs because people live further away but then spend more to get to where they need to go that can be used as a definition. Uh, there's some that would say, okay, you know, pay for all your other basic necessities and what you have left, that should be uh, used for housing. So there's lots of different definitions. But uh, this is not just an issue that is important to our students. I mean, this is something that uh, staff struggle with. This is something that faculty struggle with. Um, and so I think it's a significant issue, again, for our, our campus community. 
Um, you know, as we're looking at building housing, and I didn't give you the housing update, which I will work into this somehow. Um, we, I think, the market kind of drives what it costs to build new housing. We don't control that. So whether we build our own residence hall or we work with a, a P3 partner to do that, uh, we can negotiate what we want those rents to be, and we do try to negotiate those very vigorously, but at a certain point, it's, it's what the market demands and what the market will drive. So I think a big part of what we're trying to focus on now is how can we offset uh, those rents either through scholarships or try to drive down uh, uh, the, 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 the cost of housing by, by buying out essentially uh, students' um, costs for housing. So you know, we've worked with the Office of the President on this issue. Um, some good news, the Office of the President recently gave us $500,000 for basic needs and $500,000 for us to use for subsidies for student rents. Uh, this is something that's run through the financial aid office. So I think we have, um, we're, we're seeing that there are some mechanisms by which we can tackle these issues. Uh, but I think it's gonna continue to be a concern for us in terms of just the, the cost of, of living in the Bay Area. And I don't really know what the answer is. Again, I'm not an economist. So I'm not an economist nor I'm a mental health professional. There's probably some other things I'll say I'm not. I'm not. Uh, but in terms of the conversations that I have and the people that I talk to, uh, this is something that many institutions are struggling with. Mm -hmm. Next question comes from the audience here. And again, I'll remind people if you do have questions as we're going along, fill out the card, hold it on, hold it on up. As follows, another one of the Chancellor's priorities is, uh, in quotes, moving the needle on diversity vis-a-vis -vis underrepresented students. The chancellor has also called for HSI, that's Hispanic Serving <clears throat> Institution, um, attainment within the next test ten, 10 years as one component of moving the needle. Would you elaborate on the HSI initiative and other efforts in support of diversity from your perspective in your office? Absolutely. So one of the things that I, I, I most enjoy about my work is that I get to collaborate very closely with Cassie, Kathy Caution and Oscar DeBone. Um, Oscar is our HSI lead. In fact, I think when he sat in this very seat, he talked about that a few weeks ago. Um, we're, you're not going to achieve a goal unless you actually have a plan, right? And so I think one of the things we're trying to do right now within this umbrella of issues is develop some very specific plans for how we can achieve that goal. And uh, the chancellor uh, created this diversity initiative. We have three different committees that are working on this. Um, folks with tremendous amount of expertise um, and energy around uh, this topic. We're looking at you know, climate issues. We're looking at how to support our students once they're here. We're looking at our our admissions practices in terms of how we uh, recruit and yield students. We're looking at uh, our admissions policies. And so I think all of those are critical elements of how we will then develop some very specific goals so we can then move forward. And one of the things I appreciate about our chancellor's leadership is that she doesn't want a committee to meet and meet for a long time and develop a, you know, a big plan that's going to sit you know, on a shelf, you know, she wants action. So, you know, oftentimes with these groups, you're going to have a short time frame by which you're going to, you know, invest a bunch of energy in a very short period of time, come up with some very specific um, ideas, and then work towards implementing those. So and this is something that's critically important to us, and I think we are very fortunate in that we um, have a new wonderful leader um, in, um, uh, as our director of undergraduate admissions, uh, Femi Ogundela, who's, who uh, I think may be here somewhere. Um, so way in the back, yeah, Femi. Um, who has some tremendous um, ideas and uh, for how we can achieve some of these goals. And, and again, this is, this is a community issue. I mean, this isn't something we're gonna say, okay, this is your problem to fix, right? This is something where we all have to be able to contribute in that effort. And I know we work very closely with alumni, for example, in the recruiting that we do, because they are very passionate about wanting to be able to help us reach out to as many high schools as we can within uh, the state of California and beyond so we can recruit uh, a diverse population that we really want to reflect the population of our state. I mean, that's really the bottom line. We want our, our you know, as, as the premier state institution, not only in the state but in the world, we want, we want our student population to reflect that state population. You know, I'm thinking of all the different issues we're discussing and engaging today, and I'm curious, how do you think the job has changed for folks in your position at, at, at large public universities like ours over the years? Um, it's become much more complicated, uh, I would say, um, because we know more about the college student experience, which is a good thing. But then we also have you know, individual offices that deal with very specific issues for students that we didn't have when I started in the profession 30 years ago. 
We didn't talk about basic needs 30 years ago. We didn't necessarily have a office that dealt with veterans issues 30 years ago. Uh, we didn't necessarily have a behavioral response team 30 years ago. So um, it's become much more complicated and a big part, I think, of, of, of how um, I can be successful in my work which means being successful on behalf of students, is to make sure that we hire the best people that we can, uh, we provide the best training that we can, can, the best support that we can, making sure that we're investing in people's professional development so that they feel like they have the tools that they need so they can do their best work. Um, and that we, you know, we screw up, we try to fix it. Um, I'm a real believer that you know, we're not gonna do everything right. You know, there's gonna be times when uh, at the end of the day, we're gonna say, you know, we could have handled that issue much better uh, and let's do better next time. And do you think students' expectations have changed in terms of their role and involvement in the actual governance of the university? I mean, for myself, when I went to school, it was like, get my professors to class on time, keep the room warm in the winter, cool in the summer, good to go. Didn't really, it felt like I and my peers were not really that concerned about what was happening in the main administrative center. That seems to have changed. Is that an opportunity or a challenge? How do you see that? Am I right in what I'm saying, do you think? I think it depends on the culture of the institution. I'm not saying that you're wrong, but one of the reasons I wanted to come back to Berkeley, having worked here the first five years of my career, and then leaving for 17 years and working at other different types of institutions and then coming back, was because I felt like I was challenged hmm. uh, the most in this job, in this community, you know, in this environment. Um, and I like the fact that our students are engaged. Yeah, there's some days when I'm pulling my hair out because I wish we had the answer for them and we don't have the answer for them. But I, I would much rather work with uh, a group of students that are engaged, that, that want to change the world, that believe us when we tell them that they're going to change the world, um, and rather than other cultures, other institutions I've worked at where, you know, and it's, the administration makes a decision and there's not a peep. You know, nothing, students don't react to it. Um, thinking this is way too easy. This isn't. Sh this isn't how it should be. You know, we want our students to keep us honest, right? We want to be the best place we can be. So, uh, does this connect? I hear you talk a lot about leadership. That developing leadership in students is something really important. And obviously, that doesn't show up on the formal curriculum. But why is that so important to you? Why is that so often kind of at the very center of the things you say and the priorities that you have? I, I think. Partly because my frame is such that I personally think a lot about leadership. I like to read a lot about leadership. Mm -hmm. I like to watch leaders in terms of how they operate. Um, I like to just reflect on how I can become a better leader. And, but I think that that's really at, at core of what we can do to help students um, prepare to have an impact on the world. We know that every student that graduates from Berkeley is not going to be a CEO somewhere. Right? That doesn't mean that they can't still be a leader in their community, in their organization, um, in their temple, whatever it might be. Right? So uh, this is something that's really critical, I think, is to try to develop you know, resilience, uh, leadership, uh, the ability to think critically, uh, the ability to work in a community, the, really, the ability to see that life isn't always uh, uh, black and white, that there's a lot of gray in terms of issues. Um, and so I think all those things are critical. So two questions from the audience came in, both having to do with basic needs, and let's, let's do the first one first. Um, does relying on philanthropy to address issues like basic needs, better aid packages, and increasing diversity imply that these issues are a lower priority as opposed to making them part of our core campus budget? And I should just point out, just as background, philanthropy actually does contribute directly to the core campus budget. Yeah. But I think there's, there's an important question here about uh, very often we talk about priorities, we talk about philanthropy as if we need extra help around those. And what does that say about whether right. they're really priorities? You know, that's a very valid question. That's a very valid question. And I, and I think that, um, you know, we're, we're trying to search for answers now. I mean, we know that uh, the cost of attendance uh, continues to rise. We know that uh, living in the Bay Area uh, continues to, the expense of that continues to rise. I think it's not an either or, it's an and. Mm. Um, I think even, you know, student affairs having uh, not completely wrapped up our budget process, but we're getting close. We really try to look at, you know, in terms of meeting our budget improvement target, let's try not to, to do things that are going to impact students uh, directly. Right? We don't want to cut student jobs, for example, because that has an impact on their cost of attendance. They have less jobs. They can't then work if they want to. Um, 
But I think that this is something that, um, again, I was really referencing that in terms of building new buildings and the fact that we have sort of a prevailing um, a cost of doing that. Uh, we worked, you know, we work very, um, I mean, one of the reasons we've developed master leases, for example, is to not only provide us some beds immediately until we can build new housing, but also we're able to drive the cost down of living in a master lease facility versus just sending students to that landlord saying, you're on your own. Uh, because the landlord is very happy when they can have 100% occupancy over five years, which is what they get when, they, when we lease all those beds for them. Because then filling those beds isn't their problem, it's our problem. Um, but the trade-off is that we're able to say, no, we can't pay you what you are asking for. You need to lower this, and consequently, we've had some success at being able to do that. So we're really trying to use all different mechanisms for ad addressing those basic needs issues. So also on basic needs, really a brass tax, an important question. How do students in need find out about the UCOP subsidies for UCB students? Is it within the financial aid website? It kind of points to the navigation issue. People just have yeah. trouble. Yeah, yeah. well, this is really new. Uh, first of all, you know, we have a room full of ambassadors now that with students that you interact with, you can tell them, hey, if you haven't been to the Basic Needs Center and they, and they want to just visit to go there or they do have, they are struggling with basic needs, you can encourage them to go, go to the Basic Needs Center. So uh, this, is, this is an interesting issue because one of the things I spend a lot of time talking to my advisory board, board about is just how we communicate with students. Um, I know we think that we communicate effectively with them. Sometimes they don't always think we communicate effectively with them. Um, and I think that there's, uh, we need to try to use as many different mechanisms as we possibly can. Uh, this development of these funds I was referencing earlier on is, is, is very new. I mean, this is something we just learned about within the last few weeks. And so uh, I'm pretty confident that the Basic Needs Center will do what they can to get the word out. I know financial aid under Cruz Grimaldo's leadership is really trying to be uh, more, um, uh, trying to communicate more in terms of directly with students, trying to think of new mechanisms by which we can communicate with students using social media as a way of doing that. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's sort of not one magic way of doing that. It's, it's a multitude of ways. So let's move over to another corner of the wide world of student affairs, and that's the RSF. Um, <laughs> we, have a, we have a lot of staff here. Just what's going on with the WorkFit program and its future and its status? Thanks for asking that question. So uh, how many of you are in the WorkFit program? Okay, pretty good number of folks. Uh, this has been really helpful for me because I know when there was um, – um, an assumption that the WorkFit program was going to go away. I heard from many, many staff uh, in a very impassioned way uh, the, about the impact that the WorkFit program has on them personally, as well as the impact on their families, as well as the impact on their colleagues. So there is some money from the Office of the President that pays for a good portion of the WorkFit program. Mark Fisher and I have had a conversation with them. Uh, we're in the process of working on our next application so we can uh, secure the funding for that program. I want the program to continue because I think that, you know, with me promoting the concept of wellness, this is something that, you know, I have to put my money where my, my mouth is in terms of saying we want this program to continue. Um, I know that there's some others, some campus funds that also fund this as well. So I don't have a definitive answer today, but I'm hoping that um, in the near future we'll be able to say that we've got the funding and the program's continuing. So I may get this question wrong because I think there's a word missing. And if the person who wrote it wants to identify themselves to fill in fine. If not, I, I understand. But this is a question that has to do about how business opportunities are undertaken with the example of esports, business opportunities to generate revenue. So I think if, if I've got it right, there's an interest here in you know, what your division is exploring in terms of business opportunities, how you engage, what's happening on that front. Mm -hmm. Do I have that right? Okay. So so we have somebody within our organization, Joe Watts, which is very, who is focused on our business development, as we refer to it. I mean, this is part of the budget reality that we have as a campus now. I mean, one of the things that the chancellor has talked about is we can't just cut our budgets uh, in order to get to, uh, in order to resolve our structural deficit. We also have to increase revenue too. And one of the, the benefits we have in student affairs is that uh, businesses want access to students. And so uh, we try to do what we can to establish 
uh, relationships um, with um, vendors who may want to provide or are able to provide a service to students, something that students want, right? So. This is a very inclusive process. I mean, we have students that we talk to about the different ideas that we have. Uh, we work with the other leaders within student affairs, the directors with new student services or rec sports or the ASUC or what have you uh, to, to tap into their uh, subject matter expertise to try to grow uh, these partnerships. Um, we also work very closely with the university, UPP. Uh, university Partnership Program, uh, because they really are the ones uh, from the campus perspective that are doing this at, at writ large for the larger uh, relationships and partnerships that we develop. So this is something that we're trying to um, continue to um, increase revenue this way. If anybody here has a great idea, we'd love to check it out for ways that we can provide additional services to students. Um, so I'm hoping it will continue to grow. Good. I think we got time for two last questions. The first is, so if a large chunk of change, really large in the millions, dropped into your lap tomorrow, well, where would you direct it in student affairs? What's an area of need that you have some frustration about your ability to meet right now? As I talk to students, student leaders, I know that they're concerned about a couple of key areas. One is the lead center. They want to have more advisors uh, that they have access to. We have 1,200 student organizations. Um, and the, the, the folks in the lead center work very hard, uh, but we need to have more of them. Um, so that, that's one area. Uh, and the Career Center. We've gotten some feedback from ASUC student leaders that they'd like to see us expand what we do in the Career Center. Uh, now, this isn't to minimize all the other great areas that we have in student affairs, like the Public Service Center or other areas in the Dean of Students cl uh, Cluster or uh, outreach and admissions, what have you. But those are the two areas where the ASUC leaders have actually uh, either sent me emails of very specific things that they want to see or they've passed resolutions saying we want the institution to address these issues. I know that the LEAD Center advising is something that's very near and dear to the heart of Alex Wilford, who is our uh, soon to be former ASUC president. Last question, I get one softball. One softball. <laughs> one right. softball. What's the best part of, of doing your job? I mean, what's the part that, because there's a lot of challenges, a lot of complicated issues as evidenced by sort of the issues you've been tackling today, but what's the, what's the best part of it lets you go home a happy guy at the end of the day? Yeah, so Joseph Greenwell and I kind of disagree sometimes because he says he has the best job on campus. I said, no, 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 I've got the best job on campus uh, because I get a chance to work with the, you know, the amazing students that we have, uh, the very dedicated staff that we have, uh, people who come to work day in, day out, people who were students here that continue to, to work here. Uh, we've got one employee within the registrar's office that's been here almost 50 years. Uh, which I think is just amazing. Um, so we have, and, and it's, it's the top public institution in the world, right? Uh, now we're biased, of course, all of us, because we, we work here, uh, but that's a good news story. I mean, we actually do change, change lives, and those lives then change the world. So I can't think of a better place to come to work each and every day than UC Berkeley. So before we wrap up, just want to note that on April 18th, the next Canvas Conversation, um, our guest will be Christine Treadway. She's the Assistant Vice Chancellor uh, for Government and Community Relations. I just want to say from personal experience, that's a whole interesting, fascinating world about town gown and our relationships in Sacramento and Washington, and there's no shortage of issues and challenges on those fronts, as you could imagine. Um, and Steve, I just want to thank you for your sure. generosity and willing to come out to play on a whole wide range of issues. Thanks, and thanks to you. Thank you.